So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, dear participants of the Paris Peace Forum. Thank you very much for tuning in and a very warm welcome to all of you. This is the session like a phoenix from the ashes, multilateralism in a post-COVID world. My name is Nora Müller. I head the International Affairs Department at the Kerber Foundation in Berlin. And as a proud co-founding member of the Paris Peace Forum, I am delighted to moderate this session today. So, never let a good crisis go to waste. This is probably the single most cited quote throughout this year. And because this is the year of Brexit, I should mention that this quote is attributed to a famous Brit, namely to Winston Churchill. So for all intents and purposes, 2020 has been a year of intense crisis. And I think that the COVID pandemic has really turned out to be the great accelerator in the sense that it has accelerated a number of pre-existing trends in the international arena with the erosion of multilateralism being one of them. Or in other words, in the words of Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN, we are in a world in which global challenges are more and more integrated and in which the responses are more and more fragmented. Not so good, I would say. So is 2020 the year that will bring us the renaissance of multilateralism, of collective action, or will it be rather the opposite? Are we going to see the phoenix of international cooperation rise again from the ashes? And is this post-COVID world that we're going to see, is it going to be a world more according to Mr. Hobbes or more according to Mr. Kant? These are some of the questions that I really look forward to discussing with a fantastic panel um, with me here on the di digital stage. Let me welcome our discussants, our guest. I am very happy and thrilled to welcome Joseph Borrell with us. Um, he joins us from Brussels. As you all know, he is the high representative of the EU for foreign, foreign and security policy, and he's also one of the vice presidents of the European Commission. Mr. Borrell, fantastic to have you with us. Second in line is Clément Bourne, um, who is at home in Paris, um, the home of the Paris Peace Forum. He is the State Secretary for European Affairs at the Quai d'Orsay. Um, Clément, thanks very much for, for joining us this afternoon. Bonjour. Now, then, then we are very fortunate to have Obi Ezekwazidi with us. Dr. Obi is um, not only a former Vice President for Africa at the World Bank. Um, she's also currently an economic and public policy expert at the Africa Economic Development Policy Initiative. Dr. Obi, fantastic to have you on board as well. And last but certainly not least, um, we're joined by Natalie Samarazinge. Natalie ha has had a, an extremely busy year this year because she is the Chief of Strategy for the commemorations of the 75th anniversary um, that the UN has been marking throughout this year. So, great to have you all on board. Um, time is of the essence. We have only 45 minutes today, so let's kick this off right away. Um, I have many questions on my mind for you, but I will say to our viewers, um, please chime in. Um, if you have questions, please do ask them and write them in the live chat, and I promise I will um, I will insert them um, during our conversation. Mr. Borrell, are are you ready to to start with a with a first question? Um, I, I I thought we'll start maybe with the um, major international event of the past um, weeks and months. Um, it's now a week. 
um, that Joe Biden was elected um, the next president of the United States. And we could hear that collective sigh of relief all over Europe and beyond, I would say. And I think we can be pretty hopeful that the next U.S. administration um, will take a stronger commitment when it comes to multilateralism and collective action. So I wanted to ask you, for starters, how has this election result, how has it changed your view of the multilateral landscape? Are you, are you more optimistic? Well, uh, multilateralism is nothing more than that the laws by which uh, we manage our common house, which is international community. And this regulation is now put into question because there are more and more owners in the common house and they don't share the same vision. And the crisis uh, of multilateralism did not start with the election of Donald Trump, mm -hmm. which means that it will not end with Joe Biden. There are other causes, causes to the crisis of multilateralism many actors, uh, return to sovereignism with powerful actors with, such as China, Russia or Turkey. Problems are more complex, which makes the difficult solution. And the solution is being looked at a wider frame. It's very difficult to discuss with uh, 140 states. Now we have a, a new president of the US, and the whole question is whether this election will change things. Yes, it will change things. But uh, let's be careful. The historical political trajectories of the states are rarely modified uh, through an election. And the tight nature of the election results shows that Trump's election was not an accident especially when we look at the social distribution of votes, and we see that the, the deprived areas, the most poor areas, have massively endorsed Trump. Mm. And you sum up the, the product of the counties where Trump has won, it is only 20% of the American GMP. The other, where Biden won, it's 80% of the American GMP. I think it's very illustrative. And part of the legacy we have to be taken into account by successors. And then there is a relativization of American power, and also that uh, the employment towards Asia will not stop. So if I could come in here, Mr. Borrell, you s sound semi-optimistic, I would say, um, when it comes to big changes post-American election. Um, you also m mentioned that we're seeing a relativization of American power. We see other powers rising. And then there's the EU, of course, who's been saying for a while now that it wants to be a strong actor on the global stage. So from your point of view, at this point in time, is the EU already in a position to play ball with the Americans, with the Chinese, and, and with other big, big, big players on the block, so to speak? Well, for sure, we are ready to play our part of, of the game, especially on the relationship between US and China. We are not we don't want to be caught in the middle of this uh, confrontation. Um, we have been talking with the Americans about how to deal with China. For sure, there is agreements on something, but I think the Europeans has to defend their own interest. And we have to require the U.S. to engage again on some important issues, climate and the nuclear deal with Iran, for example, Biden committed to re-participate, uh, to reincorporate on these two deals for climate, it's sure it's going to happen. But with the GCPOA, I think it's going to be more difficult. 
what the good test about our capacity to cooperate on real issues and not just on rhetoric is if the new administration will give support to a carbon road attacks. Because in fighting climate change, this is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. And I would like here to, to issue a warning to all the Europeans that believe that the election of Biden, which is for sure an important change, a very useful change, cannot exempt us from doing our own work. We must not succumb to what I call a kind of strategic laziness. No one can replace us to take charge of our future, and certainly not the US. So we are going to play a more comfortable role because the form will change, but whatever the American president is, we must be careful to defend our autonomy of thought and autonomy of actions. When we say about the strategic autonomy, for someone it looks strange, or even unnecessary, but it's neither a strange thing, because it's just a matter of becoming adult, and it's not a luxury, and it is even less an illusion. I think it's something vital, a vital necessity for Europe to engage in the new world, in the Sahel, in Libya, or facing Turkey, it's up to us to take the responsibility. I'm, I, I think, I think if, if I could come in here for a moment, um, sir, I think a lot of people will, will agree with that. And um, uh, let's try to, to also bring some, some other people into the conversation. I'm sure um, Clément Bonne, when, when the High Representatives talks about um, European sovereignty, this is music to your ears. Um, I was wondering, um, what are your thoughts on the question of how we can make use of the next four years that will have a more um, sort of more sympathetic, if you will, American administration, one that is maybe also more leaning towards um, collective action. So how can we make those four years, how, how can we make use of them in order to make the multilateral system more shockproof, maybe more shockproof than it is right now? What, what are your thoughts on this, Clément? Oh, thank you very much. And there's one point I may put it a bit differently uh, from the ZEP, but I think we we do agree on this. I'm always very uh, interested and surprised at the same time to see how much all our EU countries, uh, we, we look at Washington and we look at the US in election times. Of course, it is very important uh, because it is a, a huge power. It is our main uh, ally and partner beyond Europe. Uh, but uh, I would be very happy that uh, uh, the same attention is paid sometimes uh, to the election at the European level uh, uh, between neighboring countries in the EU because uh, it, it says something beyond the anecdotes about the fact that we expect still a lot from Washington and from the US presidency. Uh, we are right. But elections in Europe are not as messy as they are in the US. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we should organize something more spectacular. Uh, but uh, I think it's uh, it's important, and uh, what Mr. Borrell said was exactly in this uh, on this line, to be very clear and to go on in the definition of our interests, values, and priorities. It was the efforts we have been making in terms of more uh, autonomy, in terms of security defense, cybersecurity, uh, climate leadership, and other technology trade areas uh, should remain. Uh, of course, uh, to, to go back directly to your question, uh, we can expect from the new US administration a different tone, a different style, probably a different approach to the EU and to Europe, more cooperative, and also a, a closer approach on multilateralism. Uh, it has been signaled by Mr. Biden and Ms. Harris uh, on climate for sure, probably on some other areas like the agreement regarding Iran and so on. But uh, it should be a cooperation. It should not be an expectation on our side 
from Washington to define higher priorities and interests. Also, what we see clearly is that uh, the country, the US, remains quite divided, and what we could call, could, could call Trumpism is still there. Mm. Mr. Trump got a significant result in this election. Maybe the Senate uh, will be uh, from a Republican majority, and so on and so forth, which means that what led to the election of Donald Trump four years ago remains this kind of... Uh, discomfort towards globalization, this fear of China, these uh, concerns about multilateralism will remain somehow. So we have to be ready to cooperate. We have to be active in setting a new transatlantic agenda, for sure. And just last point on this, I think the topics on which we should probably focus this transatlantic agenda should be a bit different from the past. I think on, they are very important, for sure, on security and defense. But here, I think we still have on because that knows this very, very well, to keep on our efforts to get more autonomy. It's not against the US, it's not against NATO, but I think we need more autonomy here. Uh, but on trade, for instance, on the relation we have to China in this area, I think we could uh, cooperate more with the US because, to be frank, they have probably been less naive, quicker than us on the relation to China. So I think uh, defining our priorities, trying from day one to find a new way to cooperate with the new U.S. administration, but probably to have a different focus on the main topics of the transatlantic agenda. That's how I would sum it up at this stage. Thank you, Clément. If I could push you a little further on the issue of, of collaborating on China, I do agree that there's been some sort of convergence um, when it comes how the U.S. views China and how we Europeans um, view, view China as of late. At the same time, our interests are still very different. So, um, you know, to what extent is Europe able to follow the line of a tougher China policy on the part of, of, of the US? Uh, you're right, I think um, we should define our own approach, EU approach, uh, which would not be exactly the US approach, including in the relation to China. My point is to say, I think the US have if I may put it this way, opened the eyes a bit earlier than us on the fact that international trade rules were sometimes not adapted to a rising Chinese power, that sometimes we would have to be tougher in the relation to protect some strategic investments, some mm -hmm. strategic technologies, intellectual property, and so on and so forth. And I think there was something right in this approach from the US that us Europeans did not catch as early as, as uh, or to the same extent. On this, I think we should not wait for the U.S. to say to us what we should do, but probably we can cooperate more. WTO reform, mm -hmm. some relation to China and so on, and probably this U.S. administration would be ready still to be tough on China, but in a more cooperative way with the EU. So we should use this opportunity. That said, uh, I mean, a real power and being sovereign is about defining yourself your values and your interests. So again, we should not ask Washington what to think about this interest and these values. We should define them as we have been starting to do. And if on China, for instance, we want to be more cooperative than the US regarding, I don't know, climate or biodiversity, in which for sure China has engaged more than in previous years now, uh, we should keep on with this cooperation and not ask Washington whether it's good or not to do it. Uh, but my point is not to say that uh, Mr. Biden will say to uh, Ms. von der Leyen or to Mr. Michel or to European leaders what we should do with China, but that we have an opportunity mm -hmm. to cooperate more on the relation between us all and China. That point is well taken. Thank you very much. And at this point, I, I would like to bring in um, Dr. Obi into, into the conversation. Um, what I always appreciated about your work, Dr. Obi, is that... Um, you always um, took a very close look at the nexus between international organization, multilateral organizations, and what they actually um, do for, for ordinary citizens. And it is quite interesting, and this is also one of the things that has transpired from the UN at 75 consultation process, that um, multilateral institutions are still perceived as very elitist and, and very far away, if you will, by, by a lot of people. Um, and again, I mean, I, I, let me throw the, the one million dollar question um, into your court and ask you, 
what can we actually do apart from you know the the big geopolitical discussions that we just had what can we actually do um to make multilateralism matter more um for for ordinary people what's what's your sense I um, think that uh, we need to uh, design a 21st century compliant multilateral order. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, it's a sell by date that has come for a number of the institutions that um, we know as uh, multilateral institutions. It's an entirely different world. And this different world is not all about China because I see this whole uh, obsession of Europe with China, obsession of America with China. There are many other parts of the world that are important for our global survival. Uh, it has become clear to us now uh, with uh, the uh, COVID-19 that we are all as healthy as the unhealthiest amongst us. Uh, that clearly puts uh, you know, very important uh, topics on the table for us in the way that we design a new multilateral order. I believe that an equitable multilateral system is what we need. We need to de de design institutions that uh, govern the globe in a way that we are addressing uh, those challenges of inequality and uh, the uh, some of the uh, downsides of, um, of of global trade of of, uh, of uh, uh, capitalism, which I I absolutely am a proponent of it. But we know that um, some of some elements of it are broken, and that um, you know the idea of um, a, a, a centralized location for global uh, investment does not do well for us. And so uh, we need to think uh, some of these institutions including the UN. The UN has, uh, has, has a lot that is not going right for it. You hardly know that the UN exists in today's world. Uh, the people go to the uh, UN Assembly to solve other problems other than within the, the, the institution itself. So the marginal meetings have become more important, which shows us clearly that the informal environment is gaining a lot of traction and power. Mm -hmm. How do we then uh, make sure that this whole active citizenship that we're seeing across the borders of countries, that it can become something? How do we bring the voices, the new voices, in the way that the world works? Uh, the young people in our world today don't understand a number of the political uh, institutions and norms that have followed us for many decades. We need a compliant uh, a, a 21st century compliant multilateral order. And it's an order that the young and the women would have to help us shape. And if I could come in here for a second, Dr. Obi, obviously knowing full well that there are no silver, silver bullets in international politics, but if you had to give one measure, one concrete measure, um, how to achieve the kind of equality in the international system that you're talking about, what would that one measure be? It would be a measure that brings uh, uh, people to the table afresh. I, I mean, it, it was in a certain year that uh, the world, uh, had, as then constituted by the great powers, sat around the table and designed the, uh, the, the League of Nations, and then it became the United Nations. It's time again for us to sit on the basis of mutuality of interest of nations and equality of nations and have a conversation around how the world will be governed. And by the way, I really don't like the fact that Europe finds itself in a situation where it's just simply tagging along behind the US and, the, and, and China uh, in their great power competition. The, the, the Europe has a very important role to play in designing the, 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 not the China way, not the American way, but the way that works for the world. And, and, it's, and I think it's missing the boat in, 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 in trying to, to not uh, displease any particular uh, a set of the two nations. I mean, you can displease any of them because what we want is a world that works for everybody. And that means that Europe needs to rise in its stature of leadership. And I think that what Europe is missing is that Europe is missing the importance of partnership with a continent like Africa in saying that there, we need to bring everybody around a new set of agreed universal values that would that drive equality of opportunity for countries to grow, for countries to prosper, 
for countries to do well so that the whole world will feel like a peaceful, prosperous place. That message is well taken. And I think when it comes to uh, strengthening Europe's role on the global stage, you're preaching to the converted here in, in this round. Um, Natalie, let me let me um, turn turn it over to you. Um, I, I, you've been involved heavily um, uh, in the UN at 75 process, and um, it, it was quite fascinating to see how comprehensive this massive consultation um, effort that you launched really was. And one of the things that in the course of the process really struck me was, um, and this is echoing also a little bit what uh, Dr. Obi said, that the, the Secretary General, the UN Secretary General, came up with the concept of a networked multilateralism. Could you give us a sense what exactly he means by that networked multilateralism? Thank you so so much, Nora. And first, can I just say it's a great pleasure to be here. I was at the first Paris Peace Forum, actually, with a project on strengthening global governance. So it's nice to be back. Um, so this consultation we had um, involved, you know, over a million people uh, in all countries around the world, many thousands of organizations. And really, that was the single call, that people want a greater say in global decision making and in delivery of global services, but they want to be involved at all at all levels. And I think that, you know, really matches the Secretary General's vision of this network inclusive multilateralism. And it builds on points by the previous speakers. For example, the high representative, he talked about the sort of changing nature of, of, of power and also the sort of maybe the differences between people who feel they have benefited from our current system and people who, who haven't. And also building on, on Obi's words previously. But I think when we look at power, we, we tend to look at, you know, it flowing from west to east, north to south. But I think the biggest change has been power is flowing vertically to regions, to cities, to the private sector, to civil society. Companies can have bigger bank balances than countries. Mm -hmm. uh, it, when you look at the area like technology, you could question whether it's governments who are in the driving seat. In terms of citizen engagements, I mean, who do people really trust? Look at how they organize. It's about social movements, local groups. There is this disconnect between the, with the, the institutions. And at the same time, you see from COVID, we need this whole of society response. So I think there is a big drive to look at how can the UN become more uh, you know, inclusive at all levels. So from country level, looking at what kind of partnerships are needed for maybe sharing out some of what the UN does. And I think this is the second point about those who feel who benefit from the system and those who haven't. I think the UN has been in many ways very transformative, radical at times in, in what it has changed. You know, it's really transformed our world. But it's also to some extent maintained the status quo. It has helped people, particularly in the West, say, okay, problems are things that happen elsewhere and we can solve them with humanitarian aid. We can solve them by building a refugee camp, but we don't really have to share the burden. We don't really have to, you know, get, get involved at, at this level. But now we see the problems are on our doorstep. So it's about sort of rethinking the system to, to move from maybe an institutional focus to one more of a partnership. Mm -hmm. And I think that could be really, really important because, you know, if you asked before about a silver bullet to change the UN, I think we're so often focused on tweaking the structure you know, X more members here in this forum or a different process, that just creates more static, you know, change. It doesn't create evolutionary change. But if you start putting different actors into the system, that's when you can see something that will have, you know, a real impact in terms of resilience and change and helping the UN to adapt over time. So it really is a big message that came out of our consultation and I think one that will be a focus for the UN going forward. So the future of multilateralism will be a multi-stakeholder kind of uh, multilateralism? To, to some extent. I mean, I think multi-stakeholder partnerships can work really well. We see it with the Gavi Vaccine Alliance or mm -hmm. the Global Fund for certain issues and for certain constituencies. You do need, I, 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 you know, there is this need for a universal platform that can, you know, you know rubber stamp in a good way and give that kind of legitimacy and universality to, uh, you know, initiatives that can connect initiatives, can bring people together. 
uh, that can kind of incubate and multiply. I do think there is still a need for that. But I think at the same time, we have to recognize, as Obi said, often the action is elsewhere. So let's go with the action. You know, we need to have those solutions now uh, and, and see what can be involved, you know, evolved from that organically that then comes back up to that global level. I think this would also help people have a stronger connection with the United Nations if they see there's an impact at my level that I can influence, then something that kind of trickle, trickles up in that sense. Right. Well, thank you, Natalie. You said, let's go where the action is, and that is what we should do also. Um, let's turn to some of the questions from, from the viewers that keep pouring in. Um, and here's a nice one, um, maybe for you, Clément. Um, this is about the future of diplomacy and how it is conducted. Um, let me read it out. Um, video conferences became a strong pillar of diplomatic communication, also in Europe. Do you think that diplomatic meetings will ever return to the pre-COVID formats? I do hope so. <laughs> uh, probably we will. Uh, probably we will change some habits, uh, like in all business contacts or business relations. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we found out that it was possible to have a, a good meeting uh, for one or two hours without maybe taking a plane, uh, traveling all around Europe, all around the road for just a few hours of, of business meeting. And I think it's true in diplomacy as well. So probably we will be more cautious for climate reasons and others uh, in this type of, uh, of uh, movements that we were so used to before. Uh, but that said, I do think we need, and that's quite happy, I think, unfortunate, uh, human contacts, personal discussions, physical meetings. Uh, to take an example that uh, Josep knows uh, very well as well, uh, I don't think we would have a, a recovery plan uh, at the European level uh, agreed last summer at the uh, leaders' level in the EU and now being discussed uh, with the European Parliament and being adopted, I hope, uh, finally in the coming days, uh, without physical discussions. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, we were able, and we had to anyway, uh, to organize differently at some stages, at some steps. But the big, real political moments, you need contacts. And uh, I think everyone, that my personal experience at least, feels uh, during this moment that uh, when you uh, see in, vid in video conference somebody you already know, it's okay, and you have mm -hmm. already some uh, uh, habits and uh, techniques of discussion, if I may say, but if you meet somebody for the first time, it's a bit different, you know, which, uh, which uh, uh, says that we are and we will remain some uh, social animals, if I may put it this way, and that's very, very fortunate, I think. Absolutely. We would all like to be in, in Paris right now, but at least um, we can connect with each other through through this, this video conference. Um, Mr. Borel, if I could turn to you, there's a nice question for you as well here, and, and let me read it out for you. Um, has President-elect Joe Biden given you a call as of yet? And if not, what are you going to tell him in your first conversation? Oh. <laughs> Before I will have the opportunity to talk with the President, many other high-level officials of the European Union will do. Before me, uh, the interlocutor is uh, the president of the European Council, uh, Saint Michel, and the president of the European Commission. Both of them will be the first and having the opportunity to, to visit the White House. I will interact with the US at, at another level, at the level of the Secretary of the State, which is my counterpart, the one who will replace uh, Mike Pompeo with whom, by the way, I had had quite a good personal relationship. Mm -hmm. He's a very frank person. Uh, it's, very, it's a tough uh, discussion, but uh, uh, things have been, has gone quite well on a personal basis. I don't know who's going to be the next Secretary of State uh, of the U.S. Nobody knows. But when I will have the opportunity to talk to him, I think that I have to propose that we have to update our institutional frame of uh, relations. You know, the last time that the Europeans and the Americans uh, set up an institutional 
framework of our relation was in 1995. That's a while Since ago. <laughs> then, a quite long time ago. No, 1995 it was a kind of a transatlantic, uh, transatlantic declaration. Well, the first transatlantic declaration was in 1990, and then it was another one. But I think we need to review the framework of our relations because it's not enough to say, oh, we are both part of NATO. Oh, we are both part of a Western family. You know, more than being part of a family, I want to be a partner. In a family, there's always a, a partner family. You know? There's always someone who takes the lead and the others follow. I don't want to be a family. I want to be part of a partnership in which the duties and the, and the, the duties and the obligations of each one remains clear because I think that the, the new transatlantic relation has to be much more on an equal basis. The, the, the Europeans has to go out of their mental dependency with the U.S. in many issues and to try to build a more constructive approach with mutual commitments and sharing concerns. But this requires a new institutional setting. So I would, I would propose him to build on a kind of a transatlantic agreement, transatlantic partnership, as we have with other parts of the world. We have uh, agreement, we have uh, association agreements with uh, almost everybody in the world. Why not with the U.S.? Hmm. Well, you know, for someone who is a an Atlanticist, that sounds a bit sober, I would say. I still believe that the U.S. and Europe are are part of, of the political West and part of a family in a way. But that's probably um, to be discussed at, at another time. Um, let me let me turn a family, uh, a family, you know, a family that a family the word family means different things for different people. That's it's probably not the, same, not the same thing a family in in the Western world but a family in in Southeast Asia. That's probably true. That's that's granted. You're right. So, um, Dr. Obi, if I if I could come to you with a question which is um, related to to the current Corona crisis, um, here uh, one of our viewers writes us: the coronavirus pandemic was not a black swan, i.e., a completely unexpected event. One could have predicted it to some extent. To avoid the next the next nasty surprise. Should governments invest in joint foresight? I seem to have lost. I didn't get the. Do question. you want me to? Do you want me to repeat the question? Okay. Here Please do. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So it's about the coronavirus pandemic being a not necessarily a black swan. Um, it could have been predicted, and the question is to avoid. The next nasty surprise, should governments invest in joint foresight? Indeed. I, I mean, it's very clear to us now that, um, you know, we did miss it. <laughs> I mean, it could have been predicted, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, I looked at um, the 2019 um, global risk uh, that, um, that, 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 that made the top 10, and nothing about health pandemic was on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did miss it. Um, so uh, it is, but but this has taught us a lesson that uh, these are some of the things we would have to uh, prepare ourselves for. Uh, people talk about the new normal, but the, the many next normals are things that we don't yet know, but we know will surely come. And, and so, uh, how do we reduce the vulnerability? of the entire global system by ensuring that the weakest of systems are upgraded. Uh, so this, these are part of the conversations that we must have because global public bans are more difficult to get consensus around to solve. But the more that we realize that the impact on all of us 
uh, it's, it's basic uh, explanation of how negative externalities can be too costly for even those who don't show an interest mm -hmm. in what affects their neighbors. So I would say yes, definitely. We do need a uh, such joint uh, effort uh, in uh, monitoring and health surveillance and such other uh, important uh, elements of mm -hmm. uh, that, that connectedness. And on a level from, on a scale from one to 10, um, if you had to assess the current state of preparedness when it comes to such, you know, future external shocks, how, where where would you see the international system? Is it rather a good four or is it at six? What would you say? I would probably say a four, mm -hmm. not, not, not even a six, because okay. um, it is very clear that, um, you know, our formal political systems are yet not understanding the full uh, the full consequences of not collaborating effectively across frontiers and borders. I, I think that in many ways um, uh, the, 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 the the basic rationality of actions of the nation state is most is mostly given way to all kinds of fears, all kinds of uh, uh, domestic political expediencies. And so sometimes just common sense takes flight in the way that political actors are, are managing affairs that, that are transborder related. You know, so we need to have a different kind of conversation around the issue of managing our global system and um you know i mean look a lot of the a lot of the bureaucrats in europe and in washington and and in um, addis ababa and in uh, beijing have to retire they are part of the old order they have expired in terms of the ideas that they can bring to the 21st century because i mean you sometimes you sit in a room and you're having a conversation with these kinds of bureaucrats and they are still remembering 20 years ago they are not you know upgrading their minds to the fact that it's a new we're in a new century and that this century requires a different sets of skills of engagement. Their attitudes remain the same. You can tell even without an interaction with them that they have a biased mindset about certain issues of how the world should work. And we need to upgrade that and move ourselves forward as, as a global world with universal values that will do well for us. Hmm. Okay. Well, thankfully, there are also some, there are not only bad bureaucrats, but also some good bureaucrats. So um, we, no, we shouldn't, I <laughs> we shouldn't I do bad. so. You read my lips. I didn't say bad. I said age, the age of the idea mm -hmm. is now struggling to adapt to the new demands, the new imperatives. I mean, I listened to it, Natalie, and I'm wondering, wow, why shouldn't she be the one, you know, uh, the, the, the UN Secretary General. We could do with a young woman like her because she That's understands... That's the beginning you know, of a campaign, Natalie. <laughs> mind my words. <laughs> Not some old man in his 70s. You know, we, we had enough of them already. Okay, hopefully no nobody is, is um, offended here. Um, let me let me uh, thank all of you for a fantastic um, conversation. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. I hope you did too. And it feels to me that this was only the beginning of a longer conversation that we should um, continue at some point, be it in Berlin, hopefully next year in Paris at the Paris Peace Forum 2021, in, in Brussels or elsewhere in the world. Um, Thank you all very, very much. Um, thank you, dear um, viewers, dear participants in the Paris Peace Forum um, for actively listening and for, for multiple very good and very thoughtful questions. Um, don't miss to tune in for the closing ceremony of the Paris Peace Forum um, right after this. And um, I hope to see you all very soon. Thanks very much. And most importantly, keep safe. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.